The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Partnerships and Payments, Keeping Pace with the Rapid Changing Payment Landscape. Hi, I'm Judy Howard, the Manager of Customer Experience and Training here at ARC, and I welcome you all to today's session. Uh, our uh, facilitator, I'm your facilitator and host today. Our presenters will be Jennifer Watkins, who will be introduced in just a moment, and she'll introduce uh, her colleague, Kevin Hay. Uh, before we get started and before I turn it over to Jennifer to and Kevin to kick into the presentation, just a few housekeeping um, items I want to mention. This is an interactive session. This is your opportunity to jump in and ask Jennifer and Kevin any questions that you may have on this topic. Uh, and you will do that by entering your questions into the right side in the control panel where it says questions, and they will be uh, answering those periodically throughout this presentation. We hope to get through all your questions. However, if we don't, or if there's some that seem more specific, Jennifer and Kevin will reach out to you directly after this webinar is over. Uh, this will be recorded, so no worries. If you think you've missed something, you don't have to vigorously take notes. Uh, this will be sent out in the thank you email. It will also be posted on the ARC Corp website under uh, webinars on demand. So you will always have access to it. And of course, um, you can reach out to me uh, after this webinar at any time with just some um, general questions as well. And Jennifer and Kevin will provide their contact information at the end. So uh, without further ado, Jennifer, I'm going to hand it over for you to kick this off. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Jennifer Watkins, I'm Director of Payments, and with me is Kevin Hagg, the Managing Manager of Payment Processing and Acceptance. Um, we're going to start by talking about um, what happened at the ARC Payments Forum. So let's move on. So here's our agenda. We're going to just do an overview of what happened at the Payments Forum, what the structure was, who talked, kind of like a little bit of detail um, of the event itself and who was there. and kind of what was covered at a high level. And then we'll jump into uh, some information that Kevin and I actually shared there around the ARC landscape, what's happening in data, data quality, efforts around 3D secure. We'll talk about chargebacks and some ARC initiatives, including an update on what's happening in Direct Connect, um, typically known as the uh, NDC. We, we call it Direct Connect. Um, and some other initiatives that ARC's working on that we that impact payments. And then we'll do a little bit of a look ahead. Like Judy said, put your questions in as we go, and uh, we'll be answering those questions. Um, let's go. So, so the, just an overview of the ARC Payments Forum for those of you who um, haven't heard of it before, haven't been. It's it's a group where we get together. Kevin and I think Kevin, this is the eighth or ninth year. It's been a while. Um, that we've been doing this. And so um, the goal of the payments forum is to bring everyone together, all the participants in the transaction flow to ensure we're, we are supporting payment processing in a way that provides the best customer experience, improves risk management, and therefore prevents loss, and ensures the lowest pro cost processing of payments. Um, it started 2015 where um, we had transactions that were coming through ARC that we were outputting that couldn't be processed and paid. And uh, came to find out that one of the card brands had made some changes in their data requirements and the data wasn't coming through from authorization through to settlement to ARC and output to the acquirer. So um, we needed to get all of those people in the transaction process together and make sure that we're all on the same page and working together. So that's how the payments forum started. So what did we talk about this year specifically? Um, we had presentations from the card branch, which we do every year. Um, Visa and MasterCard make changes twice annually. And um, this is an opportunity for us to give, for them to give us a preview on what's happening um, with changes, whether it's data requirements, changes to how they manage chargebacks, all of those things. Um, same with Discover and American Express. So each of them spoke at the event. We did a panel about airline distribution and payments. We had Keith Wallace from Air Canada, who, who's, he has payments in his purview as well as airline distribution, which is kind of unique. And so we wanted to get a perspective from someone who has distribution and payment in their area, how they bring that together and make that work. 
Most airlines have those two things separate, which can be challenging. Um, and he provided some great insight into what they do and what the challenges are around managing payment um, in, in a new distribution situation or era. Um, we had an agency panel where we had a couple agents get up and talk to us about what their challenges are with payments. Very interesting. We talked about Apple Pay. We talked a little bit about chargebacks. Um, we talked about challenges they have with authorizations, not getting great sort of information back in the authorization response that they can then use to, to figure out how to keep or retain that customer, provide them with another opportunity to, to pay. Um, and then we had a fraud panel, which included um, someone from Amex GBT, Delta, um, Perseus, and then someone from ARC on a panel just talking about fraud. Now, you could do a whole two-day thing about fraud. So they talked about all different topics of what's happening around fraud. We had other third parties come and talk to us. IATA did a presentation. A lot of the people that are at this event are also uh, involved with IATA. So they gave us an overview of what's happening in payments for them. Riskify is a company that does fraud prevention tools for, for merchants, and also they have a chargeback management tool. TravelX is a fascinating company. They are um, providing uh, NFT ticketing for the industry, and they've got several airlines now that are, are transitioning into an NFT ticketing um, situation. Um, that, that we could do a whole nother session about just that. Mm -hmm. Optimized Payments is a company that helps airlines ensure they're accepting payments in a way that's the most cost effective. And Elevon, one of the largest airline acquirers out there. We did special sessions. We did one uh, the, the first day with airlines only and um, talked to them about what's happening in their world and, and um, did some sort of best practices mapping and things like that. And then chargeback, chargebacks. We had a the chargeback working group, basically, the people who are involved uh, get together and talk about chargebacks. And obviously, um, a big theme is just chargeback management between agents and airlines. Um, let's go to the next slide. So the key themes that came out, um, it highlighted the need for improved payment data, whether it's authorization data, um, data in, in settlement that is going to help the transactions qualify, but it also helps reduce chargebacks because the transaction looks 100% when it gets to the card issuer like it was authorized. Um, payments authorizations is a big thing. We talked quite a bit about that. Changes in the industry. Apple Pay. I mean, Apple Pay is not new, but it's becoming more and more important for merchants to be able to accept it. And we have a challenge in our industry because you have airlines as the merchants and you have agents who are accepting on behalf of the merchant. And it was only, it's only recently that Apple Pay developed a way for a third party, like an agency, to accept a payment on behalf of a merchant, like an airline. And so um, we talked a little bit about that and how we, we can make that work in our industry. Fraud, obviously, is always a hot topic, and then chargebacks is, is another topic that came up across all different card brands, talked about fraud and chargebacks. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Kevin now to talk about the ARC land page. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. So like we did last year, uh, just running through some of the high level uh, items regarding landscape. So a year ago, we had about 236 airlines as well. So really not as much changed, although, you know, there's an ebb and flow. Uh, we drop airlines, airlines uh, decide not to participate, and then we also bring in new business. So we're about where we were a year ago. From an agency perspective, we continue to see consolidation in the agency uh, location market we had about 200 more last year so although i think it it's slowing down uh, we're still seeing some consolidation uh 82 billion uh in sales last year uh, which was i think almost more than double what we did the prior year and then we continue to monitor our what we call our portfolio between credit cards and cash historically we've been around uh, 1090 at this as well so we're close to historical averages um, with COVID and the recovery on the way, we, we decided to reach out to our uh, finance team and have share a couple of what we're looking at, potential trends and how things will trend in the future. 
Uh, we're looking at settlement transaction volumes here. I'm sure you guys have something internally uh, similar and you may be looking at other key metrics that are more appropriate. But uh, looking at this, uh, we're seeing that, you know, probably towards the end of this year, we're going to be probably five to 10 percent down. And then um, going out into 2026, we'll start to see a, a slow recovery. And we anticipate or we're forecasting that volumes will return back to the 2019 levels around 2026. If we sort of shorten that time span and look at just through the end of the year, and then looking at it by domestic and international transactions, uh, domestic we're seeing around the five to 10% range being down for 2019. Um, and international is doing a little better there from flat to 5%. And towards the end of this year, we'll probably see something more around everybody coming to close to those volumes. But on average for the year, we're probably going to end down around 5%. And then if you look at it from one other angle, when uh, broken out by agency level, um, leisure has, of course, throughout the year always been performing quite well. They're around 15 to 20% above where they were in 2019. And corporate and OTAs have been down around the, the 10 to 15% range. So in total, when you look at it, that sort of gets us back to that about 5% down that we talked about earlier. I'm gonna stop there real quick just to see if there's any questions. Nothing coming in, okay. We don't have so, any questions yet. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and just look at a little bit more detail around the portfolio. So as mentioned, uh, last year we did about 82 billion, uh, 39 billion in 2021. And I think what's really interesting here is we're about halfway through the year and we're you know almost 50% uh, more uh, than we were in 2021. So hopefully next year when we get together, we're gonna see uh, that hockey stick curve continue up and hopefully down around the volumes that we saw in 2019. As I mentioned, we continue to monitor cash and credit, uh, and it's been historically around 10%. And we're starting to see a little bit of a fall off in, in what we're seeing for cash now. Um, credit cards picking up a little bit more, but we just continue to monitor as, uh, you know, there is a fair amount of cash going through ARC, and so it's always good to understand what that volume is. Um, from a brand perspective, and this is by dollars, um, probably a little surprise here. Visa, of course, is by far the dominant brand out there. But what I find interesting here is if you look in the middle, you have, uh, I guess I'll call it a little competition between Amex and MasterCard. Uh, Amex was uh, outperforming MasterCard. And then in the middle of the pandemic, as commercial or corporate travel sort of slowed to a, a trickle, uh, MasterCard was still doing all right with leisure. And that's where uh, they sort of overtook Amex. And then now that corporate travel is starting to come back a little bit, you can see the swing back to uh, the Amex volume uh, surpassing MasterCard. And also uh, UA UATP cards are starting to pick up a little volume as well. And I think, again, more attributed to corporate and we're seeing them pick up some additional issuers. So they're picking up some volume that way. And then looking by transaction volume, uh, again, you know, sort of the middle of the slide, there's some, some activity that's interesting. So if we extended this back beyond 2019, you'd see Amex, uh, being ahead of MasterCard in transaction volume. Um, but now, you know, with the way things have gone, uh, MasterCard is, from a transaction perspective, ahead of Amex. And then as well, we see UATP uh, gaining some momentum as far as transaction activity. And then if we bring it all together uh, with the average ticket, you can sort of see how the other slides sort of work together. Amex, of course, is your highest ticket, high corporate travel, probably a little bit more affluent customer, probably a little bit more international travel. So their average ticket's up uh, about 870. Um, and then UATP, again, they're more of a corporate travel card, so a higher ticket that you're gonna see there. Um, but I think it's also interesting that cash has always been consistently about the third highest average ticket. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we also try to keep track of what's happening with cash. So before I go on to the next slide, I don't see any questions. Okay, so I'll move on. So nope. we'll talk a little bit about debt, debt, debt integrity. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, there was a lot of conversations uh, around debt integrity. All the brands talked about the importance of having 
good quality data uh, as things continue to go mobile and e-commerce continues to grow um, issuers are always looking at ways to make sure that they can provide their customers the biggest opportunity or the largest available to buy so they can go out and purchase and so data is key yeah, throughout the chain um, so really this is something that i've added what is arc's role in payment data integrity um, so there's work that we do behind the scenes to, to get us in a position where we can monitor data and, and help the industry uh, receive the best qualifications uh, along with the data. So we meet with the brands on a fairly regular basis, whether it's a bi-monthly or on a quarterly basis. Uh, we're making sure that we're having conversations with them uh, throughout the year on what's happening in their world and we share what we're seeing in our world. Um, and we also want to be aware of new data elements or any edits that they're putting in place uh, because those new data elements and edits uh, you know, may impact or will impact uh, what the data qualifications and data issues are that we need to make sure we're aware of so we can adjust things on our side and our specs and, and support those uh, new initiatives. We meet regular with, regularly with acquirers, um, whether that's you know, monthly with some, um, bi-monthly with others, quarterly with others. And again, you know, the acquirers really have that interaction with the brands as well. And so making sure that we're in sync with the acquirers who are in sync with the brands and making sure we can support, you know, again, as I mentioned, new data elements and if we have to update anything in our spec. And also we're heavily dependent on the acquirers and some of the airlines uh, that are on the phone to bring to uh, our attention data related issues. Uh, we don't have a lot of insight as to what is happening on the interchange level or the cost level. And I'll talk a little bit about more of that in, uh, in a bit. But yeah, without the acquirers reaching out or the airlines reaching out to us telling that they're seeing issues with the data, uh, we're in the dark to some degree. So we're heavily dependent on their cooperation and to help us there. And of course, from a GDS perspective, we are always working with the GDS. We have bi-monthly meetings with them as well, um, have a data conversations as part of our regular touch base topics with them. Uh, always looking at ways to improve the data quality. And again, you'll see some graphs on uh, our progression through the last four, five, six years. Uh, and then of course, any new data elements the brands and inquiries are looking at, we have to make sure that that information's in our specs so we can pass it along. And so really from an ARC perspective, uh, you know, I look at us as facilitators, uh, just from the standpoint that there's really not a lot we can do from a coding perspective, um, you know, that's really up to the GDSs to make sure that they're doing what they need on the front end to uh, make sure their applications are meeting the requirements. So we can monitor that data. Um, we can look at the brand requirements and we can try to identify those gaps. Um, and then we can look at GDS performance and work with the GDSs to improve that. But it really comes down to the GDSs, you know, making the changes, and then you as agents and airlines out there, if there are concerns or if we do identify issues or if your acquirer comes to you with, you with issues, you know, reaching out to your GDS and, and helping to make them aware of that, those issues um, and the importance of getting them corrected. So it's, uh, it really is a partnership across many brands or many partnerships uh, to make the data flow accurately and to make sure things are working correctly along those lines. Um, so let's dig a little deeper. So why is data integrity important? Um, really from the perspective of, as we mentioned, and Jennifer alluded to this earlier, um, you know, from an authorization, authorization perspective, uh, there's certain data elements that we'll cover um, that impact interchange and compliance fees with the brands. And when those data elements are missing, uh, the transaction may not look as if it's properly authorized and the issuer may decline it or the issuer may reject the transaction or the issuer may with the customer charge it back um, and so there's also certain data elements that when are present help to keep the cost of those transactions to the airline and qualify them at the best possible price um, and so really that's one of our main goals as we're looking through this effort and monitoring data and making sure that those data elements are there so the transactions are uh, cost effective for the airlines. And also looking at making sure with some of those data elements being there that the compliance fees um, are as minimal as possible. 
and if those data elements or authorization data elements aren't in the transactions or captured, then there's also the possibility of a chargeback down the road. Um, and those chargebacks then, you know, potentially end up back at UV agencies uh, in the uh, course of a debit memo. So the data flows from the agency with the GDS to ARC over to the acquirers and out to the issuers. Um, and when that data is not missing, we end up, you know, potentially with chargebacks. Or in the worst case scenario, those transactions may not settle uh, with the airlines and the airlines don't get paid. Um, and then again, that may generate a debit memo back. So when we're looking at the data elements and looking for those gaps, we're really trying to make sure that the transactions qualify at the best rates. Um, we're keeping compliance fees to a minimum. We're trying to reduce chargebacks for the airlines and thus the agencies, and we're making sure the airlines get paid. So from a data integrity standpoint, um, we started this effort back in about 2015, and really what was driving it, as Jennifer alluded to earlier, is a, you know, a certain brand came along and made a change, and you know, the data wasn't there, and airlines weren't getting paid. So uh, we started our efforts. We look at uh, all the data elements that are necessary to qualify and are important for the transaction to clear and settle, and we started monitoring them. And we ended up doing some work with the GSs, and as you can see, we started to make some vast improvements as to when we started through, and this has taken us through mid-2018. Uh, when we started this effort, we put out a goal of about, you know, 3%. Didn't know if that was realistic or not, trying to make sure that the data is there 97% of the time, but we sort of threw that target out there. And uh, around mid-May of 2018, uh, we were starting to see that happen pretty consistently across all the data elements that we we're monitoring. Uh, we're going to jump forward to 2020. Um, we added some new data elements. Um, and again, as you can see, things progressed. We started working with the GDSs and we started to improve those data elements. Um, and so that's all good news. Uh, another thing that we noticed is the core data elements that we're looking at before, we started to see a little bit of an uptick in how those data elements were missing or poor quality. And we track this down to its changes. A lot of its changes, as you agencies and airlines well know, took place during the pandemic. Um, and we found a little bit of a gap with some of our exchange data. Um, so again, we worked with the GDSs and you can start to see towards 2021 uh, that that started to improve. Um, and then we continued to improve the data through 2022. So now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at uh, some of the specifics involved. So real quick to give you a little bit of idea. So this is an internal dashboard that we have. It's not probably the prettiest for uh, showing outside, but really this gives us the ability to look at specific data elements that are required by the brands. Um, Amex has about 16 data elements that we are monitoring. We're not going to run through them all. I just took a snapshot uh, of a couple just to see. But so from this perspective, um, you know, we're looking at the data elements for Amex transactions being there about 98, 99% of the time, um, which is really good. Fortunately, Amex, uh, doesn't have the complex interchange system that MasterCard and Visa do, but they are a little bit more in line with compliance. So there are a number of data, ele data ed edits, excuse me, that they have in place um, that could trigger compliance related fees. So we continue to work with the GDSs to making sure that those data elements are there, the edits aren't triggered, and those compliance fees don't end up back in the airlines or potentially uh, you know, debit memos out to the agencies. So we're still hoping that we can do better. Um, I've talked with the GDSs and really our goal is to try to get it down to one or sub one. Um, we know we're never gonna get down to 100% just because there are certain things that happen in the marketplace that you know, just don't, make, don't allow the data to take place or the data to be there. So um, moving along, taking just a snapshot of MasterCard. So with MasterCard, you know, again, we're seeing some improvement in the data. Uh, it was down probably around 2%, and then towards the pandemic, we saw it jump up. But now MasterCard is around 3%, so about 97% of the time, uh, the data is out there. And so again, we have some opportunities to improve uh, along the lines with, Amer or I'm sorry, with MasterCard in enhancing that data and getting it there a little better. And then if we jump to Visa, 
Uh, Visa, there is the four main data elements that we're monitoring. And uh, again, I think with, in general, I'm going to step back and take, in general, the, the key to authorization is having it take place at ticketing. Um, and when it takes place at ticketing, we should be able to have all the data elements present, captured by the GDSs and passed. So from that perspective, anytime that there's something out of the normal order flow, um, those data elements could go missing and thus you would start to see those data elements pop up here um, and they wouldn't be populated and they would be missing at, in the case of Visa, for instance, about 3% of the time. So from an agency perspective, it's always key to try to get those transactions to stay within the GDS's framework or the GDS's uh, tool and get those transactions processed through the GDS and getting that data passed onto ARC so we can pass it along. So um, I'm just gonna share some of the things we see that impact that process is, um, for instance, if an agency would go ahead and issue a ticket, they'd go out in the process and get the authorization, um, and then they would void the ticket. Um, and then they would go ahead and maybe within the void window still go ahead and reissue that ticket. Um, but they may not go out and get an authorization. They just may use the authorization from the pre previous ticket saying, hey, it was a $500 transaction. The tra transaction may be 500 or a little less. So I'm just gonna use that approval code to go ahead and put this transaction through because I knew that one was good. Well, in that case, that approval code isn't associated directly with that transaction. And you're not gonna be able to have the GDS pick up that additional authorization data elements that were included on the original transaction. So that transaction, although it was approved earlier and had the data elements on your new ticket, that data will not be there. And that transaction then may flow through and decline, uh, well, not decline, but it may reject at the issuer or it may end up as a chargeback. So those are just, that's just one example of a scenario where you know, you have an authorization, you did things within the system, but then because of the way the transaction handled a little bit later, uh, the data wasn't there and caused uh, a potential issue with either a chargeback, not qualifying at the best rate. So, and that's a little bit look at some of the data elements that we monitor and work with the GDSs on. So before I go further, are there any questions? No new questions. There's someone about Direct Connect, but I'm going to talk about Direct Connect um, here in a moment. Okay. Um, Great. There's nothing. Yeah, I mean, someone was looking for the leisure versus all the all other travel slide again, but I, you know, we're going to make that available at the end to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I think that's pretty much it. Good, then I will move on and just give an update on 3D Secure. So ARC has been supporting 3D Secure um, for probably since 2017. Uh, we worked with the brands and the acquirers and the GDSs to identify the key data elements necessary and then updated our spec and uh, you know, have been, has been out there and ready to uh, be used by agencies. We're not seeing a whole lot of interest, I guess, from the agency community. Uh, as we're talking with the GDSs, we're not seeing a whole lot of activity uh, with 3D secure transactions coming through ARC. Um, we know there's some challenges um, from a customer service perspective, and the brands continue to work on how they can improve, I guess, their, their challenges or seeing fewer challenges out there to help improve the overall customer experience with 3DS. But from a brand perspective, uh, the major ones out there, Amex has their safe key product, Discover Protect by MasterCard has identity check and Visa has Visa Secure. So those are the 3D products out there by brand. ARC supports the data requirements for all these, as well as the GDSs and the acquirers support those data elements that are necessary. Protect by is the only one that we're still working with. The Discover. Uh, is looking at how they can make this work in the agency channel. As, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, there's some challenges with third parties uh, getting involved. And so the other ones have figured it out and we're still working with Discover as far as 
how they can make protect by work. From a GDS perspective, um, there's some work that GDSs have to do. Of course, they have to set up a authentication API uh, for the agencies to work with. Um, they're handling the authorization. So there's certain data from the authentication message that they need to pass along in the authorization message before they pass it along to ARC in the SPUR file or the system provider reporting file as we call it here. And so those are the data elements that we're watching for and those are the data elements that will help uh, with the liability shift. And then as mentioned, ARC, we are in a position and have been supporting the data elements for 3DS and we've also shared those uh, data requirements with the credit card billing file and this is the file we send out to the airlines processors uh, on that side. Uh, the acquirers um, have also, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we send the credit card billing file to the acquirers so we work with them to make sure that they're in a position to support uh, 3DS as well. And then some of you may not know, but EMVCO is a card scheme uh, company. The major brands are all part of it. And EMVCO is really the one that sets the authentication standard for 3DS. So the brands work together, try to identify to get some level of consistency. And then EMVCO is the one that goes out and sets the standard as far as how that data looks and should be passed. And then that helps uh, with the brands to communicate that to all the parties who need to support uh, 3DS. And then of course, agencies, you guys have the heavy lift on the front end. You have to select and connect to a third party authentication provider. Um, in the most part, you may need to uh, connect to the GDS's API in order to share that additional authentication data and make it happen. Um, so there's definitely some work that the agencies need to do in order to take advantage of 3D secure and the liability shift. Um, but the good news is it's out there. Uh, it can be supported through the ecosystem. Um, and it's just a matter of finding probably the right use cases and the right timing and to you know, bring this on board and, and make it work for the industry. But all players are ready. So any questions? Yeah, we have, we have a couple questions here. Um, one of them is, is there a report available from ARC to view on the agency level for the missing data? Um, we can probably get down to the missing data at the agency level, but it really pertains to the GDSs. If you are doing 3DS through your uh, GDS. Sorry, this is then, this is not a 3DS question. It's just oh, a general data quality oh, question. I apologize. What? I apologize. I thought since we were just finishing no, up the, the GDS. Sorry, group, I should so. have said we were kind of going back a bit. Nope, sorry. Nope. <laughs> yes. Yes. So yes. So the data the data screens that we're looking for and and good point. I appreciate the person who asked the question. Um, we do have the ability to filter quite extensively on those previous screens. I mean, we can get down to a GDS, we can get down to an agency. Um, in certain instances, large agencies that have multiple um, agency levels below, um, we can get to, down to some of those agency levels as well. And we can get down to airlines. So um, for instance, if you want to see how uh, I'll just use an example. Kevin's travel agency, I want to see how Sabre's performing with transactions that are going through American Airlines. So yes, we can get down and we can look at those that data and how it's performing um, and then give that feedback to you. And then if necessary, we can even look at grabbing a sample of those transactions and you know further reviewing them to see what's going on and, and what we can do to improve that data. So we do have some, some good capabilities. And um, again, I will use a little bit of plug for the ARCS payment form. Um, you know, when I'm there, I, I also throw this out to the airlines and say, hey, guys, any airline uh, and agency, if you guys want to take a look at how you're performing, let me know. And we can, uh, you know, go ahead and give you examples. We can run through different scenarios. We can run through different brands. Um, so we have a lot of ways we can slice and dice the data by agency. So if you're interested, um, I have my contact information at the end, and we can definitely go ahead and, and share that. Okay. Um, 
Well, there's a question about if we could share the volumes of OTAs that do that instant ticketing and off together versus not. Um, I, yeah, yeah. I, that one's a tough That's one. <laughs> yeah, that one we'd have to take a look at some of the data. About the only way we can look at it, and this that doesn't address the issue specifically, but in those circumstances when the flow of the transaction is, is out of the norm um, and that data is missing. So this is where the GDSs then have to come into play. We share that data back with the GDS and they can look at those transactions and sometimes they have the ability to see what was done. So in the case of maybe that ticket, that agent ticketed the transaction, they voided it and reissued. Um, they can identify some of those things in the flow that they have access to. Um, or they may reach out to somebody at the agency to have you guys look at the transaction. Um, but yeah, from an ARC perspective, it's hard to pinpoint that because we're not seeing what's happening specifically on the front end as that transaction is being, uh, is happening through the GDS's system. So hopefully that uh, gives you guys some insight. Here's another question. Um, and this one I'm, well, okay. Is ARC planning an API for ARC Pay for agencies that are working with Direct Connect to Airlines to use their NDC and still be able to, to charge fees through ARC Pay? This is a great question. I can, I think I can answer right now. Um, ARC Pay has developed an API. And um, Joey Cavanaugh is the uh, director of ArcPay and worked very hard on this project. It is live, it is active, it's ready to go. Um, and I'm happy to put anyone who's interested in using the ArcPay API in touch with Joey Cavanaugh. Um, yeah, the goal obviously was to make sure that agents who want to use ArcPay can continue to use it, even though they're not doing their transactions through the GDS. So um, that is available. and. Um, I'll follow up with you after and uh, put you in touch with Joey. We probably need to do a whole nother webinar about ArcPay and the API and how ArcPay is working. Um, here's what, does Arc have any plans to build out support for alternative payment methods or international markets? Is this driven by the airline? So I can, I can talk about this one a little bit. So Arc can support alternative Payment. So today we support, um, there's, there's several, I mean like Union Pay, um, I don't know if I would call that a, a um, alternative payment, but I think when I think of alternative payments, I'm thinking of wallets. Um, we do support, support Buy Now Pay Later, so we're able to support um, Uplift, which is the biggest Buy Now Pay Later in the airline space or travel space. Um, ARC does support that today. Um, Apple Pay, we can support as well. It's just the heavy lift for enabling Apple Pay is at the point of sale. The agency is going to have to develop some infrastructure to be able to accept Apple Pay on behalf of an airline and then have that transaction come through the GDS to ARC. Um, when it comes from the GDS to ARC, it looks like a regular credit card transaction. Visa or Apple Pay supports Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover. So those transactions would be processed through ARC just like those forms of payment. But um, the infrastructure on the front end needs to be in place to make that transaction so it can settle successfully. So we are very interested in, in, in further enabling it. Uh, but our other challenge is we don't have airlines that have enabled Apple Pay. So it's hard for an agency to enable, do that work up front to enable Apple Pay when there aren't any airlines that are accepting it. And so we've kind of got a chicken and the egg thing going on with um, airlines and agents. If you're an agency that's interested in Apple Pay, um, uh, we would love to do a proof of concept just to, to prove it out, make sure that it can work through all the different GDSs. And then, um, then maybe we'll be in a position, better position to go to all of the airlines and say, hey, it's easy, just turn it on. And, uh, and we'll be able to enable it. Um, um, what's the biggest challenge you're facing in the airline, with facing the airlines? What is the biggest challenge facing your airlines currently? Um, that is a big question. We could probably do it in a whole other webinar on that. Um, let's move on sort of to the next, the next bit and we'll, uh, 
And go. we'll back to you, Jennifer. We'll get to these questions before we're done. <laughs> back to me. Chargebacks and disputes, everyone's favorite topic. I am I'm not going to belabor this too much, but one of the, you know, I know it's important to everyone. It's kind of a hot topic in our industry, so I wanted to at least touch on it here. So, Deb and memo, buy by memo reason. You can see here the biggest is commissions, which is the, the blue at the bottom, and then comes chargebacks, which is right above that. The good news is that. Percentage of chargebacks uh, in, in overall debit memos is right about where it was in 2019. So we have survived the craziness of 2020 and 2021, and we are back to about where we were in, in 2019 when it comes to chargebacks as a percentage of debit memos. Let's look at it by account. Um, oh, that was count. This is, val this is value. Um, so you can see when you look at it by the value, chargebacks is the biggest by far, and it's because it's the entire transaction. When you're talking about a commission or something else in the transaction, it's going to be a portion of the transaction. On a chargeback, it's the whole thing. So when it comes to dollars, it is the biggest piece. Again, we're pretty close. We're a little above where we were in 2019, but we're pretty close to where we were in 2019, which is kind of getting back to normal. Um, so we'll look at on the next, we'll look at it by chargeback reason trends. Uh, the, the big piece at the bottom, the, the pink piece is fraud, unauthorized fraud. I mean, that's always kind of the, been the biggest piece of chargebacks. <coughs> um, the part that kind of makes me crazy on here is the yellow and then the blue at the top, because that's either other, yellow is other, and blue is just chargeback. And so the frustration there is that the airline hasn't provided any information about what the reason for that chargeback is. So it doesn't provide much information for the agent to go on to either try to respond or to um, at least look at what, what it is that might be in their process that's driving chargeback, it's whether it's like Kevin's been talking about, the data. Is there a data issue that's driving those? We don't know when, when the reason for the chargeback is other or chargeback. So um, let's go on. So here's memos by amount. You can see in 2022, we were um, back, well, up to where we were in 2020 numbers, but the volumes were increasing again. So um, when you look at the next, the next bit shows us by um, percentage. You'll see in 2022, we're back down to about six basis points of um, chargebacks or of transactions end up as chargebacks. Um, you can see in 2020, it was up to 20 basis points, which was, was it a lot, but I mean, it's pretty amazing in our industry to have only four basis points of chargebacks in our in our volume. So um, we're pretty happy to be back down to where we were in 2019 with chargebacks. Year to date, 2023. So the current state, ARC has a chargeback working group. I think if you've been following um, that group through the pandemic, there were times when we were meeting weekly to address the challenges that we everyone was experiencing. And then it moved to monthly and now to quarterly. So um, we're back to sort of status quo again on, on chargebacks meeting quarterly. Kevin alluded to if the data isn't aligned, there, we're seeing an increase in technical chargebacks. So these are chargebacks that may have been authorized, but because, you know, it was the, the scenario that Kevin described where it was authorized and then voided and then that approval code was used for another transaction, that's going to drive technical chargebacks. And so we're seeing an increase of those. And it's really because the card brands have changed how they um, assess what kind of edits they're doing on transactions, what they're allowing issuers to do. And so it's kind of opened that door to more technical chargebacks where, you know, we, we hear agents say, well, I've been doing that for years. Yeah, well, the card brands are cracking down now and that's what's driving some of these technical disputes. Um, and we, and we know, we continue to know that the biggest, one of the biggest pain points, besides fraud, obviously, is chargeback management and the challenge of um, agents getting an opportunity to respond to disputes. 
because we've got some airlines out there that do not give agents an opportunity to respond. The first time the agent sees it is with the Devon memo. And that's a huge frustration point for everyone. Moving on. So direct connect, got a few questions about this. And now that the questions are piling, I'm the one managing the questions. So we've got some questions piling up here, but I think we'll have a little bit of time at the end. Direct connect. So we're see, we've seen an increase in, in our direct direct connect. Let me just take a step back for a second. Is the same most in the industry? It's typically referred to as NDC. Um, NDC is a schema, and so Arc has kind of moved from using the term NDC to direct connect, which means airlines um, providing data directly, um, allowing the airline to access the data directly from them. Um, as opposed to through the GDS artifact process. Um, we've seen volumes are up. We have about nine, almost 10% of ARC's transactions right now are direct connect transactions. Um, by sales, you, it's, it's only about 6%. So it's really a lot of the leisure market moving that way. It's a lower do dollar transactions coming through um, direct connect than traditional um, ARC transaction processing. Uh, you can see here, and actually it's demonstrated on the next slide, but you can see here we've got almost twice as many agents in April 2023 as we had in March 2023. Um, there was a large airline, large U.S. airline, that made an announcement of some changes they were making around NDC, which has driven up that volume. So we have more agencies participating. We have 20 airlines that are involved in Direct Connect right now. Let's move on. So here it shows three, those 300 agents. Uh, 348 is where we are right now. We have 24 airlines. We expect to be signing up several, onboarding several other airlines this year. It's it's constant. We have a, a pretty significant, not significant. We have a we have a good backlog of airlines that are showing interest in in doing direct connect, and so Arc has been working with them to onboard and we'll continue to do that. So I expect us to see um, growth in Direct Connect and volume moving out of the traditional GDS artifact um, distribution channel. Let's move on. There's, so ARC initiatives, just to give you all a heads up of sort of things that are happening at ARC specifically. And I wanna I'm gonna try to wrap this up so we can get to some questions. ARC is expediting exchanges. So our, one of the challenges we've had is ARC processes exchanges on a weekly basis. So at the end of the week, we take all, we, the, the agent has the entire week to manage the exchanges. And at the end of the week, we, t we take those out and we send them off to the credit card companies for processing. Um, that causes a, a whole slew of problems. Number one, your customers don't get their refunds fast, fast enough. When, there's, when it's done that way. They don't get billed fast enough when it's done that way. And it also increases the expense on those transactions and puts them potentially at risk of dispute because, or chargeback, because they are not missing, they're not making the card brand timeliness requirements. And so ARC is expediting exchanges, which for airlines, that means um, faster data, um, transactions qualifying at better rates, uh, customers getting billed more timely. For airlines, that means customers being billed more timely, but it also means that agents are gonna be required to manage their exchanges on a daily or multiple times a week basis, as opposed to waiting to the end of the week and then fixing all the exchange transactions. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's just, it has to happen just because customers have expectations that they're going to be billed or credited in a timely manner. And, and we're just not doing that and with the way it's set up right now, the way we output exchanges. Zero dollar transactions for agents out there that um, are dealing with the zero dollar transactions and that would happen maybe with a child and it's sitting in a seat, uh, an exchange that um, has, is an even exchange. Those transactions come into us with a zero dollar amount, but um, we require that it have a credit card, I'm sorry, cash form of payment. So agents are having to go in and touch every single one of those transactions to 
get it to, in, to a situation where ARC can process it. So we are making changes to our system to simplify that for the airline agents. Um, expediting data. Um, this is just a, an attempt to output data to airlines more quickly. But our big project for next year is going to be support for multiple forms of payment. This is something airlines and agents have been asking for, for, for from ARC for years. And we understand it's really important. And so it's something that we're going to be working on next year. And then finally, union pay. Union pay, we've enabled union pay for years. Um, we just don't have a lot of airlines that are accepting it. And um, not sure that the agents have a, a understanding that it's an acceptable form of payment as well. So we're just going to be sort of talking a little bit more about union pay and, and enabling it. Let's move on. So I showed this slide last year, and you can see I had in big, big letters with crypto, buy now, pay later. Um, let's go on to the next one. And so the, my updated slide for this year around what I think, where I think we're going to see more um, movement. Uh, I have FedNow on here. FedNow just went live. Real-time payment, I think, is a big thing we're going to hear about. Instead of crypto, I have crypto over here in little letters, but blockchain is here. I think we're going to hear more and more about blockchain crypto off the radar a little bit just because some of the challenges crypto has had um, with volatility and fraud and all that good stuff. Um, but what's important for airlines is retailing and customer experience. And so I think it's going to be really important for us to, to put focus on, on those areas. Open banking when it comes to payment is also a big thing. I mean, open banking has been active in, and working in Europe for years. In the U.S., we're just a little slow on the open banking piece, but it's it's coming. Let's, I, I think that's it, Kevin. Um, so th this is how you get in touch with Kevin and I. Let's do some questions here. we got a lot of them. Um, so here's an API question. Um, and I think we've answered this one about the API. And so I'm, I'm, I need to put some folks in touch with uh, Joey on, on uh, the API. Um, tra the travel extension allows merchants to include a wide range of itinerary data in the authentication request. So, okay, so this is, um, a question about authorization, travel extension data, meaning it either well it, uh, and either authentication or authorization. And the question is around whether or not that's being supported. Um, we're not seeing adoption of 3D Secure or any authentication in the U.S. So this would be sort of a step beyond that. So I think we need to see some adoption of 3D Secure. Um, before we talk about sort of an, a travel extension onto that authentication process. Happy to talk about it more. Um, we're having challenges just around authorization in general and, and making authorization an experience for an agency where they get valuable data back um, and getting GDSs to support sort of a uh, enhanced authorization is, is challenging as well, but happy to talk about that more. Um, here's a question about cruise lines. Um, I don't think that's gonna, that's not, doesn't sound like it is applicable to ARC, but happy to talk about it. Um, other than payment to ARC for the settlement periods via the bank issuing the ACH, is there any other form of payment to ARC, like paying directly to ARC account via wire transfer or other form of payment? Um, not, there is not any type of payment that is done by ARC. So ARC Pay is ARC's product that enables agents to accept payment from their customers, um, like a service fee. Um, ARC does not have a situation where we're acting on behalf of um, and other merchants, um, airlines, to facilitate payment. Obviously, we facilitate the settlement of cash, which I think you've mentioned here, um, which is 10% of the transactions. I mean, in 2019, that was over $10 billion. So it's, it's not 
tiny. Um, here's one about v, um, VCN's virtual cards. If the airline would open up to virtual cards, then they can reduce the number of chargebacks. Um, can they? Um, airlines don't absorb the loss for chargebacks typically, but again, happy to happy to have a conversation about that. Um, so yeah, Jennifer, there's one here on if, if we don't use the same approval code to reissue the ticket um, that was voided, we hear from the customer. So uh, I think that that's oh, a valid about point. about the open to buy? Yes, yeah, especially now with um, you know the high percentage of debit cards that are out there. Um, I, I think it would be interesting to try to understand how often this happens. I, I know that there are GDSs out there that void those transactions. So you know the, it should be taking thing. place. Yep, void the auth. I apologize. Yep, void the auth when the uh, transaction has been voided. Um, so, and, and understand, I mean, this has always been a challenge in the industry. I, my former background was in retail, um, and we had the same issue that we really had to depend on others to make sure those reversals went through. So, but um, yeah, so you, you take the risk of the customer getting upset, um, but hopefully the GDS will, you know, reverse the auth and you'll be fine. Um, but then you also take the risk of the chargeback. So I think it's something you have to look within your organization on, you know, what, how do you want to handle that and what is a higher priority of that customer satisfaction um, or the potential of the risk. And, and understand, I mean, that's what I said earlier, that there'd be a certain percentage of transactions that we're just not going to resolve. And, and if that's the way you opt to handle it, then as long as you understand the potential repercussions, um, you know, then, then it's, you know, at least out, out there for everybody to realize and making choices correctly. So I think, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're you're closer to the GDSs, but I my understanding is the GDSs do off reversals when there's mm -hmm. a void. And so yep. when they reverse that off, if you try to use that approval code again, it's going to be invalid. It's the issuer received a reversal message that is no longer a valid approval code. So I think that's the so reversals were developed so that retailers could be assured that their customers were going to get the open to buy back on their account or in the case of a debit card be able to access the funds again um, because of that challenge so um, my hope is that it's working that way within the gds i think probably agents don't realize that the gs is actually reversing that authorization yeah. when there's a void um we have a question here about a chargeback question, and we only have two minutes. Um, as you mentioned, the chargebacks do ones. Okay, so that's the void. Um, can we, the airline, implement the fee to the customer if the airline wants, if the airline wins the chargeback? There's no penalty to the customer to file a chargeback. While it takes valuable resources and time, the airline to fight a chargeback, can we invoice? A chargeback fee. I mean, I would say <laughs> if you want to, you can as an as a merchant um, who has a relationship with the customer, you can deal with your customer however you want to. Um, I don't think there's um, you'd probably be more successful at having that customer not be able to fly you again, or they pay a fee. I, I don't. I don't. I have no idea. But that the card brands don't. You know allow for something like that or facilitate that. Um, I think that's it for, I mean, we've got more and no. we'll be, we'll be able to reach out to them. <laughs> One more. Do you want to talk about 2024? Yeah, I think we do. 2024. Elevate and travel to connect. So, so ARC um, is partnering with ATP Go and their Elevate event and ARC's Travel Connect event to do a joint event in 2024. These are the dates, April 9 through 11. And the ARC Payments Forum will now be included as a track on that event. We expect it, I mean, Travel Connect and Elevate were big events. I think we're anticipating upwards of 600 people to be attending this event. Um, and Kevin and I are hopeful we'll get more people on the payments track to talk about uh, payments specifically. 
But yeah, that's happening April 9 through 11. Put it on your calendar for uh, 2024. And I do Judy, know I'll hand that. it over to you. <laughs> okay. We're going to start the questions just to jump in real quick. It, one of the survey questions we'll ask about adding your email. So um, make sure you answer the survey question. So if you're interested, we can get you on the invite list. Great, great. And hopefully mostly everybody on this call will be on the invite list. But again, like Jennifer and Kevin said, it's going to be really big this um, in 2024 because we are joining forces. And so when you do uh, get those registrations, I would, um, if you're interested, I'd register early just to make sure you reserve your spot. So, but uh, a big uh, round of applause to Jennifer and Kevin. Thanks for uh, providing all this great information. And especially for all of you that took the time out of your busy days to join us on the call today. Uh, as we've said, this is being recorded. We will get this um, out to you. And for any lingering questions that you may have, you can reach out to Jennifer or Kevin, or you can always reach out to me, jhoward at artcorp.com, and I'll make sure that they get those questions. So um, don't worry, your questions will be answered if we didn't address them here today. So thank you again. We have um, some Fraud Awareness Month coming up in September. The, we'll have a couple of webinars because we've been doing them throughout the year. One will be September 20th, and the other will be September 27th. Wednesdays. So take uh, make sure you look out for those. We have some NDC sessions coming up and uh, some other really exciting ones. So please always keep on the lookout and reach out if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day or evening. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye.